I wanted today to, to really bring ourselves to the point that we understand that God is for us. I think sometimes we feel like God's against us. We might say that we think he's against us, but, but we, we act and live as if he was against us in the things that go on in our life. Through illnesses, through hard times, through financial struggles, through, through, through just marriage issues, through parenting struggles, through, through work and, and, and the struggles we go through with bosses and coworkers and, and just, you know, home struggles of, 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 of you know, the, just the daily grind of things or car troubles. And we sometimes wonder, is God for me or not? Right? Am I the only one that sometimes has that moment of like, God, are you for me? Like, like we may not say it out loud, but we, 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 we act like it. And I want us to kind of get to the point where we start to change our mindset on how we walk that out. That we change our mind on, on, on the way we live. And so, listen, I want us to start finding joy in hard times. Because I promise you this, hard times are going to keep coming. I promise you. And, and, and we're in, a, you know, we can go down, it's an election year, it's going to be really difficult this year, right? We're going to have to deal with whatever that looks like. And then you know what, that, 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 that's not even the, the, the problem. The problem for me when I look at it is the church lives like the world. We do. I was at this, this event that, uh, that in, in Springfield yesterday, this fentanyl awareness event, and, and listen, fentanyl is killing people. It is killing people everywhere, and, and it's not just in one drug. It's being cut into everything, and, and, and it's, it's literally just Russian roulette of when it kills you if, you if you're involved in it. And I was in this crowd of people on, on the north side of Springfield, kind of kind of my roots, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, you know what? This group of people right here is no different than this group of people right here. And we can go and we can go and we can go to the Apple Festival or we can go to Wilder Days. And you know, you can look around and you're like, that's the same group of people. Different faces, but the same struggles, the same issues, the same problems. We want to say that, oh, that's city problems. That's country boy problems and country girl problems, and, and that's that's urban or rural life problems. And we want to and we want to and we want to say that, but listen, the problem is. You're either following God or you're not. You're either trusting as Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, or you're not. I want to share just a a brief testimony that that of of a cousin of mine that got saved on Wednesday because I'm just excited about it. I'm stoked about it. God knows. I've been praying for my family for a long time. I got a lot of unsaved family. But you know what? My family is no different than your family. There's people that need Jesus. They're people that need Jesus. And so, and so my cousin, he lives in just on the other side of Ash Grove toward Walnut Grove. And listen, that's not close. It's like an hour and a half or more away. And so he lives out there and he, he had to get his truck worked on and ended up being a guy that he knows that lives on the other side of Ava. And so he goes to this guy on the other side of Ava from way out there to work, get his truck worked on. And is this guy who knows him, they've, they've done work like that before. And so he's ta- he just decides to start talking to him about Christ. He said, I always knew that he was a follower or whatever. He didn't understand the terms, right? Because we throw terms out there like, like Christianese. You know, we just, we know these things because we've been in church for a minute. So he's like, I, I ended up there when he's witnessing to me, telling me that I need, I'm missing something in my life. And he starts talking to him about Christ and says, you need to go to church. He goes, I've known him for like 10 years, and I knew he was different, but he's never really like pushed it on me. But he said that this time he felt like he was supposed to. And so he goes, okay, well, he's like, I drive by this Crossway Church in Springfield, and he's like, I drive by that church a lot, and he's like, it's kind of been on my heart lately. He's like, so maybe I'll try that out, because that's, I mean, it's in Springfield, it's not all the way out here, which I get, that's a, this is a long way out here from there. And so he ends up at Crossway on a Wednesday night, and I just love God. 
And he ends up, they do small groups at night instead of their regular Bible study, which is, you know, if you ever go visit a church for the first time, you've never been to church, and you walk in and they're like, hey, we're breaking up into small groups, your heart stops, right? Like, oh, great. I can't just hide in the crowd. Like, I'm a pastor, and I'd be like, oh, no. So he's, here he is, him and his wife, and their little guy is six years old. He's in the children's thing playing. And, and so they, they break up in these small groups, and he's in this group with this couple, And they're like, oh, your last name's Cartwright. Do you know Richard Cartwright? And he goes, well, I know a Richard Cartwright. That's my uncle, which would be my dad. He goes, did he work at Redneck Trailer Supplies? He goes, yeah, he he did. And my dad's gone to be with the Lord now. Praise God, he got saved a little before he passed away. Once again, God's good. And, And so, and so he's like, this is really weird. So my 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 nephew or my cousin is talking to this guy, and his this guy's wife is talking to his wife, and she goes. Cartwright, that's kind of a, an interesting name. Do you, do you know a Brenda Cartwright? And she's like, yeah, that's my husband's aunt, which is my mom. And so this husband and wife that didn't even know that they knew these two people, and listen, my parents had been divorced since I was 26, so they wasn't like they were talking about Richard and Brenda or hanging out with them. But this is how God works. So he left that night. He's like, that was super strange that they talked about Rick and Brenda, I think I'm supposed to go talk to Dustin. And so he get, they reach out to Shana, and they show up here on Wednesday night to just have a conversation and go eat. We never got to eat. We were doing spiritual eating. But, he, but we're sitting in the office, just me and him, and talking about some stuff, and he goes, it's just such a weird, just a bunch of coincidences that got me here. I'm like, <laughs> There's no such thing as coincidences. There's no such thing. God has these divine appointments, but I wasn't throwing out those words because he didn't know those words. It's okay. And I'm just sitting there listening to him, and I'm like, God is preparing his heart. And, and, And so he's 29 years old. He's quite a bit younger than me. Oh, I love you, Hazel. But and then he's like, and I start going down Romans Road with him. And I, I'm talking to him about how it's not a fancy prayer. It's none of that. It's about believing in your heart that, that God ro- raised Jesus from the, from the dead and, and that he's at the right hand of the Father, that he died for us. And I walked him through all that. And I said, and then also down further, it says, and we profess it with our mouth. And before we walked out of there, he had gotten saved. And, and I started thinking, absolutely, woo. I started thinking, he's a representative of your family. All the family members that you have, they're like, I don't know how to reach them. You know how many conversations I've had with this cousin? I probably haven't had five in our entire life. He's significantly younger than me. We, we'd never hung out growing up. And, and, and honestly, to be just transparent with you, when I found the Lord, I had to separate myself from a lot of family. It was what I had to do because I was in no season to help anybody with anything. I was a broken, brand new Christian that had to figure this out with the Lord. And I started thinking this week, God knew that last Wednesday, that moment would happen. If I was going to be obedient, it would happen. And God knows God is for you. I want you to be excited today about God is for you. You heard last week, you heard the, the third week of This Is Us, we, it was the prodigal child, right? And, 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 we, and, and the God knows and God is for us no matter what we're walking through, no matter where we're at. If you have your Bibles handy, go ahead and open them up to, to Luke chapter 12. And I just love how God has already got a plan in place, but here's what he wants. He wants you and I to be obedient. And are we ready to be obedient so the lost can know Christ? There's a brother in our church that has been uh, praying heavily for a friend of his, and, and, and amazingly enough, we've got, to, we got great news of his salvation this week. Amen. Amen. You know... <laughs> All salvations aren't just happening inside the church house at the altars. 
victory because people that love Christ are sharing that Christ with people who don't know Christ yet. And they're hungry and they're hurting and they're broken just like we are. Except they don't know what can fill the void. I believe most of us live a life as if God isn't present all the time. Would you agree with that? That you live your life like God isn't always there? I believe that we, uh, we, have, we believe that we have time to get things right, so there's no reason to rush, right? We, we walk through this life like it's no big deal. I've always got tomorrow, or I've always got later on today. I've got, I'll start Monday following Jesus. I'll start Monday reading the Bible. That's, what, that's who we are. We, oh, I, I, I didn't do it by, by Wednesday. I'll just start next Monday now. And if we don't do it by then, we'll start the next Monday. Well, then we're already halfway through September right by then, but so we might as well wait till October 1st because that's how we live our life. As if God is in present right now and said, you know what? Right now is your day. Right now is your time. God is present all the time and you can't hide from him. Let that rest in your thoughts for a minute. What have you done this week that you've done right in front of God? and you acted like he wasn't there. That's a little humbling probably for some of us. And you are not promised another second. But here's the reality, that God is for you, he loves you, he sees you, your struggles, your good moments. God hears you always, even when you're not talking to him. Let that rest Even if you're not talking to him, he hears you. Whether it's good or bad, he hears you. So why wouldn't we just talk to him? In Luke chapter 12, it says this. If you need a Bible, slip your hand up. We'll give you one. You can have it. Take it home with you. Make it it something that's part of your life daily. Luke chapter 12 says this, under these circumstances, after many thousands of people had gathered together that they were stepping on one another, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the, hip, of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will, be, that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. According to Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after have no more that they can do, but I warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents, yet not one of them is forgotten before God? Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And I say to you, everyone who who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess them also before the angels of God. And he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, will, it will be forgiven him. But he who speaks blasphemies against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. When they bring before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. You know, God knows you. God cares for you. God has a plan for you. We hear these things all the time. As Christians, if you're a believer in this room, you've heard these things. But do you walk out these things? Do you walk in trust and faith that whatever you go into, God has already prepared the place. God has already let his Holy Spirit begin to work. Or are you so caught up in the fear of the things of this world that you say, I'm not going to go until I'm 100% sure with what I can see with my own eyes 
that I'm safe. You know what scripture doesn't say? It doesn't say, walk with me and you'll be safe. It says he'll provide for us. He'll love us. And that when this body fails, if we believe in him, he will take us to him. Draw us in. You know what that tells me? That I may, I may go through some times that are going to hurt. This is under these circumstances, after so many thousands of people had gathered together, they were stepping on one another. They're, they're, they're tripping and, and, and falling and, and literally hurting each other, trying to get closer and move around. Like it's a big, massive number of people trying to hear what this Jesus is saying. Yeah, we look for the convenient times to go hear what this Jesus says. He says, don't neglect to meet. Well, it might be packed. I don't want to go to a very big church. I don't know if you know this or not, but when we get to heaven, it's going to be real big. And it won't be like, well... The assembly people are done. The, uh, the uh, Baptists can come in now and worship. Oh, the, the Baptist people are done. The uh, non-denominational ones, those people, they can come in and worship now. Oh, they're done. Now the Methodists can come in and, 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 and start worshiping. No, we're all going to lift our voices. We may not even be able to lift our eyes up, but we're going to lift our voices and worship together because he is a good God. And he begins saying to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You know, we hear this rumor in the world all the time. I don't want to go to church because there's so many hypocrites there. Which means we have something to do, Christians, absolutely. We need to be transparent and we need to be vulnerable so they know that we know we're not perfect. We can't walk out into this world and be like, well, look at you all. You didn't go to church today. I went to church today. I'm a better Christian than you. Oh, you went to that church? Well, our church has bigger attendance than yours or more faithful members. I bet the budget at our church is bigger than yours, so we must have a better church. God must love us more. That's what we do. We do that in our mind. We compare the body with the body, and why are we doing that? Do you sit around looking at your legs and saying, boy, this left leg sure looks a lot better than my right leg? (laughs) Well, Carol probably does because Carol's weird. (laughs) But we love you, Carol. We know she's weird because we've seen her son. (laughs) But but he said, beware of the hypocrites. They're, They're hypocrites. Of course they are. Beware of the unleaven. What does it mean to leaven? Leaven, I'm no baker, right? If you've ever seen me cook, I mean, you wouldn't tell if it's leavened bread or unleavened bread. It's burnt. It's burnt whether it's, whether it's airy or not airy. So to be unleavened is, is, is kind of flat, not ri- no, nothing, nothing added to it. But to be leavened, it's, you add something to it, right? You have to add like a baking soda or baking powder or, or some kind of yeast or something to the bread to help it get airy, and, 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 and that gives it a better look and, honestly, a little better flavor. Unleavened bread typically isn't like, mmm, delicious. Put a lot of honey on unleavened bread if you're Dustin. But when I read that scripture, I started thinking, beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees because what do they do? They take God and they keep adding to They keep adding to. They're trying to leaven God. All the time, they're trying to leaven Christ. Bring him up to what looks appealing, to what looks desirable, to what they might want to see, to get God to to a point where they're like, yeah, that's the God that I want to see. Because sometimes when we look at God, we're like, oh, I've got to change something, and I don't want to see that. You see, we need the unleavened Christ. The real Christ, not added to. You know, Scripture, we're not supposed to add to or take away. We're supposed to read the verses for what the verses are. We're supposed to read the words for what the words mean. And we're supposed to take those and we're supposed to live it out. 
not, not add to or take away the uncomfortable parts, but we're supposed to, we're supposed to take the scriptures and then say, this is what it says, and now I have to walk it out. But the Pharisees said, you know what? Let's keep adding rules so that they can be more powerful and the things that are followed look appealing to them. And they became hypocrites and had zero interest in change. But, but there was nothing... There is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. I love this because literally Christ is saying, you can try to hide your life, but it's going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed. And so when it's revealed, what do you want people to see? This morning, if someone saw your life, what would you want them to see? When my cousin came and visited me last Wednesday, 20 years ago, I would not have been prepared. I don't know that 15 years ago, I could have really done what I needed to do in preparation because I don't know that I would have been more about me or more about God. I would like to say more about God, but then I know the truth of how I walked. So I don't know that the fruit would say more about God. But I know today, I know today I want to be more like Christ than I have ever wanted to be in my life. I want that so bad because I want people to look at me and say, there's no added, there's no filler. There's just a a Christ follower right there. And to the world, it says just a Christ follower. But to be just a Christ follower means to have the God of all creation for you with you, beside you, behind you, around you, and and to encourage you, and he loves you, and he says, accordingly, accordingly, whatever is said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. I want you to think, just think about the last month, think about, it's September 1st, right, it's the first today? Oh, it's a great day to start reading the Bible and be consistent for all you people that have to have it marked on a calendar on a first. But I want you to think about August, just August. We won't even go back way far. We'll just go to August. Are the things you said in your house, are the way you treated your wife or the way you treated your husband or the way you treated your children or the way you treated your family or the way you treated your coworkers or the way you treated anybody, the gas station attendant, or the lady at McDonald's that got your burger wrong, or the things you said and thought about them, the things you want to be shouted from the rooftop. A lot of us will be like, well, can we edit that? Because I'm sure there's some things I probably said that mm, I, don't want to, I don't want that shouted from the rooftop. Well, then that means we have things to change in our life. This scripture says God knows me, he is for me, but I also must be for God. And I also must know God. If I do not know God, there's no way I can start to see my life change. I have to see my life change if I'm gonna be more like Christ. If I'm gonna want the voice that I have to be shouted from the rooftops, it better be something that Christ loves. Or I better shut up. We will be accountable for what we say and who we really are behind closed doors. At your house, when the doors close and the porch light off and you're just sitting around the house or you're doing things around the house, that's who you really are. The way you act there, that's who you really are. Would you bring that person into here? Would you bring that person into the church? The same language, the same demeanor, the same actions, the same beer can, the same joint, would, that, would you be the same person? Would you come in here cussing like crazy because that's what you do there, but not when I come to church because I gotta be reverent. Reverent isn't just for the church house. You are the temple if you have Christ. You have reverence for the Lord who is inside of you. I talked to a guy yesterday. Man, he was fired up and a little bit crazy. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. But he was good. Because you know what he kept telling me? He kept reminding me. He said, do you know Jesus? I said, I do. 
He goes, then you have the great I am inside of you. The great I am is inside of you. The great I am. I am who they say I am is inside of you. That I am is inside of you. Not this I am. This I am is a screw up. He'll mess things up. He'll fall flat on his face if he's left to his own device. But the great I am, flawless, perfect, 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 doesn't even know how to mess up. He's perfection. And as crazy as the guy was, well, there were some prophetic things that happened a little bit, though. Like just speaking to each other, encouraging each other. Not like prophecy, I'm telling you what's going on down the road or sell it to you for $2,200 or something like that. But I'm talking like encouragement through our lives stuff. Strong discernment. And a great reminder that if you are a believer in Christ, the great I am rests inside of you. So why would you have doubts of who he is? And if he is inside of you, why do you have doubts of who you are? I should have told him that. That's pretty good. Now I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after have nothing more that they can do. Did you catch that? Those apostles were hearing him say this. You know why? Because they were going to die. They were going to believe in that Jesus Christ to their death. And not just them, but those that are around. There were so many people that died because they knew. They seen the death, burial, resurrection. They believed it because they saw it. If you saw that, would you, would you go to death for it? Absolutely you would. So we can't just say, well, it was a fluke because one person did it. Maybe two people did it. All of the apostles, except for one, and he didn't have a fun life physically. And then you have all the others that, that were martyred because they watched and seen the profession of the great I am. And they knew that when the, when the resurrection happened and he ascended and the Holy Spirit came down, the great I am was inside of them. They knew there was nothing that could stop them. They knew it. So they, they took this scripture very seriously. He told me not to worry about that they can harm me physically. Because once they, even if they harm me physically to the point of death, what more can they do? Nothing. Because even at that point, if I'm a believer and I have the great I am in me, I stay with the great I am. We don't get separated. He says, though, here's something that you need to realize. He says, but I, I warn you who to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed someone, has the power to throw them into hell, to send that person to hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. It's a capital H. Who's that? You're talking about God. He has, we got to fear the separation from God. We don't fear walking with God. We don't fear going places with God. We don't fear, we should not fear physical harm. We shouldn't fear anything except for not being with him all the time. Yet we live this life like he's not with us all the time. Because the fruit's there. That's how I know. I know it in, 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 in my own life when I'm living like that, and I know it, and I can see it in your life when you live like that. And you need to be surveying yourself too. Because those things matter. So we should have a healthy fear of separation from him. He knows you, though. Do you know him? And it says, are five sparrows not sold for two Assyria, and yet not one of them has gone unnoticed in the sight of God. Not one of them. God notices even his smallest, most worldly, insignificant creatures. And if he doesn't miss a beat on those, he doesn't forget those, why in the world would we think that he's going to forget us? Even if you don't choose him, he doesn't forget you. You just chose not to be with him. He doesn't forget his creation. He doesn't forget that he loves you. He doesn't forget how valuable you are to him. He loves you. He loves you so much. But, but even the hairs of your head are all counted. 
For some of us, I think he's talking hair follicles. Others have gorgeous manes of hair. There's a lot of us bald people, though. And we know that God loves bald people. We've seen some scripture back in Kings, right? (laughs) Which makes me wonder, Pastor Hayden is bald. He's got two bears living in his yard. I don't think you should ever go to his house and make fun of him for being bald. That's like a recipe for disaster. God's already pre, pre, pre-organized some stuff there. So I think we should all be like, hey, great bald head, PhD. Just keep your bears away from me. But he says, even the hairs on your head are counted. Do not fear you are more valuable than the great number of sparrows. You can't, there, there's not even a value that's placed on you more than the fact that Christ loves you. Because what is more valuable than that? What's more valuable than What's more valuable than the love of Christ? He made you. Of course he knows the number of hairs you have on your head. He knows when you're having knee pains or shoulder pains or back pains. He knows when you're excited and, 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 and joyful. He knows when you're hurting and, and depressed. He knows when you are in every moment of your life going through. He knows it. Yet we walk through life so often putting him on the back burner until we've tried everything else. We pray and talk to him when we've tried everything else. Now I say to you, everyone who confesses me before people, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before people will be denied before the angels of God. Wouldn't you love to know that the moment you accept Christ as as your Savior, just think about this. The moment that happens, Jesus is telling them all, hey, everyone, this person just just joined the family. My my, my cousin, Jared, that just got saved, that moment that he he believed, and I've seen it in his eyes, that, that joy. If you've ever got to watch somebody receive Christ, like there's something that changes in them, just in their face. They don't understand all the Bible yet. I don't understand all the Bible. I've been studying it forever. I went to four years of college for it and and, and studied it for hours and hours a day. And I still, every time I read, I learn something new. We were in the middle of Bible study on Wednesday night and we were talking about Stephen. and, And for the life of me, I've read that a million times and never once noticed the part that says that he fell to his knees. It doesn't matter how many times you read the word of God Something new will come to life if you are hungry for something new from God. He knows you and what you can handle and what you need, but you've got to want and you've got to desire. Because he's not going to hand you more than you, than, 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 than you deserve to have because he's going to give you more than you can handle, right? Don't believe the lie of God only gives you what you can handle. He's going to give you more than you can handle, but he's going to expect you to call upon him to handle it. And he has a a designed amount of stuff to put on you to further his glory, not yours, not so you can look back and say, look how awesome I was. I'm telling you, I love love that, that quote, preach, die, and be forgotten. You gotta share the gospel, die, and the world just needs to remember the gospel, not your name. If the first thing the church says is, oh, you got to come see my pastor, that's a terrible starter. I've never met a man good enough to go watch. But I know a God good enough to follow. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some that preach the gospel better than the others. But you know why? Because they're probably doing the homework. They're probably putting in the time to know the gospel in a way that is different than other people. You know, in the next three weeks, I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. The next three weeks, I'm, I'm not preaching. Pastor Hayden won't be here. But Pastor Tucker, Pastor Lee, and Pastor Ken 
And I'm not telling you when they're preaching because they're not all, they're, none of them are preaching the whole day. They'll be alternating around. So you just got to show up. They're going to come and they're going to preach the gospel. I'm so excited because they, they, they all preach in different places all the time. They do different things. But I'm excited for you to hear them because none of us are the same. And so it's, it's, it's exciting to get to hear and, and other preachers share the gospel truth. And don't you want the Lord to share you with them, with the angels? So we should start sharing the Lord with the people. Why would we expect that if we're not going to do this? That means when you go out there outside today, you got to go share the gospel with somebody. And you're not doing it just so Jesus will say, hey, look what they're doing. You do it so that they, at some point in time, will receive Christ and the Lord can look at the angels and say, we got no, we got one more. We got another one. We got another one. Isn't that what we want? My goodness, if you don't, go back to bed, go home. Goodness, I love the Lord. God puts us above all creation. Verse 11, now when they bring you before the synagogues and the officials and the authorities, do not worry about how or what to speak in your defense or what to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you that in that very hour what you ought to say. And I love the example of this. If you're not coming to Wednesday night Bible study, you need to be in here. The adult Bible study is awesome because we're, we just got through seeing the perfect example of the Holy Spirit giving Stephen exactly what to say at the moment he was supposed to say it. And what's crazy is Stephen's about to be murdered. And not once does Stephen say, but you don't, don't, please don't. I've done a good job. I've served hard. I just love Jesus. He didn't say any of that. He started giving them the history of their, of their lineage and what, what Moses said and what Aaron said and what, and what, what, what Isaac and just one after another and David and just kept telling them the history of their lineage and what the Lord did every time they stopped following him and every time the leader stepped up. He just kept giving them scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. And then, then at the end he said, you stiff-necked people. I don't ever want to be a church that's full of stiff-necked people. I have been a church. Of st I've been a stiff-necked person. I was a person at one point in time. I wore the suit jacket at the door as a greeter and didn't care about who was coming through the door. And it wasn't about the jacket or the position or anything else. I just didn't care about the person coming in. It was just cool that they came in. But God says, what about the soul of the one walking through the door? What about the soul of the person that you're talking to? If he knows me, he knows well enough to know that I had to be changed. I couldn't hide it from him. He knew that I wasn't perfect. He knows I'm still not perfect. He knows that I struggle. He knows who drives me crazy. He knows who I can't tolerate. He knows who, who I get short-tempered with. And he knows me so well, he sends me to scriptures to encourage me to be different. And so when those moments come and those people come and the, and the tough times come, the right thing comes out and not my flesh. Because this flesh is a failure. But my God is not. We can look at this scripture and say, oh, well, he was talking to the, to the apostles. And he was talking to his followers there, not us. I think he's telling us the very same thing. Now, when they bring you before people and they accuse you of things, do not worry about how to defend yourself. That's the first thing we do, Right? We don't even go into the battle until we feel like we have a strong defense. I got to get it all planned out. 
I got to get it all ironed out in my head. Anybody else like a, man, I, I tell you what I do in my head. I will have the full on battle before I ever even say a word in my head. Anybody else like that? I've already played out every scenario in my head. I got to stop doing that, right? I got to be like, oh, nope, I can't be like that because I don't know what God is already doing in their heart. But my flesh says, well, you know the kind of person they are. Well, I know the kind of person I am. And I know what happens when I let Jesus lead. No, and I don't. What if they do that? So how can I go in the, in the, into anything with a predetermined notion of who they are? What I need to do is go in there saying, I'm going to trust God has already got a plan. And I am going to study up on the word so that whenever he has me go into a situation, whatever it is, he will tell me what to say. Just as he did with Stephen. Because my best defense is scripture. My best defense is scripture. I'm not going to outsmart Satan. He's been going at this longer than I have. You're not going to either. But we live like we will. God is for you. He loves you. He sees you your struggles, your good moments, your bad moments. God hears you always, even when you're not talking to him. So why wouldn't you want to live a life that realizes that God knows you all the time? You know, the scripture in Luke it's all about God cares and God knows and he, he has every piece of aspect of us memorized perfectly. Why? Because he created us. Why did he create me? That might be what your thought is say. Why did God create me? Well, God created you because he loves you. God created you because he wants you to do work with him. God created you because he wants you to do ministry with him. God created you first so you would call him God of your life. And then the second part is so you would serve him so others will call him God of their life. I love the fact that we've had so many salvations in the lives of the people that we know you look at that cross back there. Just look at that thing, that big old cross back there. That's 99 lights. That filled up pretty quick this year. But we didn't stop sharing the gospel because we filled that up, right? We don't just stop because, man, that looks cool. When you shut the lights off, it glows. It's really neat. That's just a reminder of 99 lives that we got to share Jesus with and let them know that God knows you. God cares for you. Let me ask you this. The person that you got to lead to Christ, if you've got to lead one to Christ, how you doing on, on discipling them? How you doing on teaching them about Christ? My cousin, I shared that with you. I had bought another Bible for somebody else to look at and see if they liked it. It wasn't big enough font for him, which is fine, because I knew now what that Bible was for. It was for him. When he walked into my office, he had never owned a Bible. He had never opened one up. But now he has one, and he's got a highlighter, and he's already starting to highlight in it. But I can't just say, oh, I've done my part. Who's next? i got to reach out, and i got to say, hey, are you reading? Are you studying? Are you doing things? Are you learning? What have you read? Can I talk you through it? Because, you know, when I first started reading the Bible, I had a King James Bible. And listen, I love that thing, but I did not know what it meant. I don't talk with these and nows. I can read it now and fully understand it. But in the beginning, I had to have somebody that said, this is what this means. This is what this means. And this is what God's saying right here in this scripture. You see, God knew me, and he knew I couldn't do it by myself, and I needed people. So you know what he did? He brought people into my life that were willing to say, I want to get to know you because we're brothers in Christ now. 
I want to equip you so you can go out and lead someone else. That's what we're supposed to do. It's Labor Day weekend. It's the last big weekend of the summer. I was just thinking this last week that we came out of church and it was dark already. And I was like, man, I love Christmas, but I love summer. I think we should celebrate Christmas in July. We should probably celebrate it all year long, but... Can you say something? I know this doesn't ever happen. <laughs> so, while Dustin was in a meeting with Jared that yeah, on Wednesday, I walked his wife and his child around the church and just talked to them and showed them around and. Um, we were talking about our family and how difficult our family is. Dustin's family, my family's great, but no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> but um, we were talking about how, like, the struggles in our family, and um, his wife said to me that they had been talking about Jesus and getting saved for the last, like, two weeks. And um, he, I guess Jared had asked his wife, um, she said, he said, well, why did you ask me to come to church with you on Easter? And she said, because I, I know you don't know the Lord and I know you're not saved. And that's important to me because I want you to be in heaven with me. And he was like, so you're telling me if I don't have Jesus in my heart and I don't accept him, then I'm not going to go to heaven. And she said, no, you're not. And um, he went to his friend and talked to his friend, and his friend said the same thing. Um, and he was like, if, if you were killed today, where would you go? And Jared said, I don't know where I would go. And he was like, well, you need to fix that because this is a real possibility. And he said, well, where do you think I would go? And his friend said, well, I don't think that you would go to heaven. I think you would go to hell because you haven't accepted Jesus. And um, so he told his wife, he was like, why why didn't you ever tell me that? Like they've been married for, I don't know. Yeah. They have a six year old son. And she said, well, I don't think that you would go to heaven. And he said, why did you never tell me that? And for me, like it crushed me because how many times do we walk around this world assuming that people know the Lord at, or have heard of him or have heard that like you have two choices. And if you don't choose heaven, if you don't choose Jesus and to follow him, there is a second alternative and you don't want that. And for him to be so close to us, it, it, like in proximity and in our bloodline and for him to say like, well, why didn't you tell me that? I was so taken back because what opportunities have I missed not telling him that, but also not telling other people because you just don't know if you don't know. So, you know, I, uh, that's so true. Are we afraid to ask people? Are we afraid to tell people? You know, God knows that. And he'll give you the boldness to get through it. You know, I'll, I'll I was, uh, the youth pastor at Ava highway church of Nazarene. This is the first time I did ministry. It was, uh, I was a youth pastor there, and there was this young lady in my youth group who was like a youth leader for me. Powerful young lady, strong in her voice. And she went to the altar after like, I don't know, months, months and months after me being a youth pastor. And she goes to the altar, and she gets saved. I'm like, what in the world just happened? And she goes, I've never been saved. Guys, God knows us. He knows our shortcomings, but here's the deal. We've got to step into that. God, you know what I'm short on. You know what I'm missing. You know what's going on in my life. You know what I don't know. You, you know where I'm going to show up short in this conversation. I need you. Do we have those conversations with him? Do we study the gospel? Do we study the Bible so that when we show up, that the words will just come out of us? Because here's what's crazy. We're in a room full of people, right? How many of us have lived our life? Listen, not everybody in this room knows Jesus. 
I wish it was so. I wish they did. But not everybody in this room knows Jesus. Don't take for granted the fact that, that everybody around you knows Jesus. Listen, we go to the nursing home and do ministry. How many people have been saved in the nursing home, Craig? Six, seven, eight? I don't even know what it is. It's several. In the, in the six, how long have you been there? Six months? You know, what, you know what I always forget about until just this last recent time frame? I always forget about the nursing home because I'm like, oh, well, the most of them have heard Jesus their entire life. But have they? Have they really been told about Jesus Christ and how he can be their Lord and Savior and how he knows them? He knows them, but they don't know him, so we need to introduce them. Man, I don't know. I don't know what this morning's supposed to look like. If you came this morning thinking, oh, pastor's going to have it all together, you are wrong. Because here's what I know. I know God loves me, and I love him. And I have to study that Bible. I have to. Because the only way I'm going to stay connected to him and learn about him. The only other thing I wonder in this room is where are you at in that? I know some of you, I know some of you that study the Bible relentlessly because you come and talk to me and share stuff with me. I love that. I love it. I think if more people read the Bible, more people would be eager to share what they've learned. Ask yourself, if I've never shared the Bible with someone, is it because I'm not studying the Bible enough to share it? Listen, this is a get real moment today. This is no fuzzy, warm, hoorah moment. But it can be. This is, a, this is a real moment right now. This is a real moment in your life that you came to church on September 1st of 2024 and God presented the, the, the Bible before you. That's why we have it. He's given it to us. He's presented it here. I've shared it with you. Now what are you going to do with it? Because no matter what you do, what you say, he knows. You can go ahead and kill him down. That's fine. He knows your heart. He knows your words. He knows every, every sinful thing you're a part of. And are you willing, are you willing to step up your faith? Because here's, the, here's another thing I know about God. If you're willing to step in it, he's willing to give you more. If you're willing to step up, he's willing to show up every time. He doesn't ever show up late. He doesn't show up, he doesn't show up after the math has been, has been done and figured out. He's writing out the equation for you. But do you trust him? 